Hello and welcome to this ISRF webinar, Freedom, the One Good Thing That We've Got, celebrating the release of Annalisa Dane's book, Freedom and Unruly History. I'll shortly be handing over to ISRF Director of Research, Chris Newfield, who will be hosting tonight's event. First, some housekeeping. Uh, we're using the Zoom webinar, so only panelists will have their cameras and microphones activated tonight. Audience members can feel free to relax away from their usual Zoom bookcases. Please use the Q&A box, which should be available at the bottom of your screen, to submit short questions for any of tonight's panellists. You can upvote questions that other people have submitted to indicate your interest. Our academic editor, Lars Cornersen, will curate a selection of questions to be put to the panellists towards the end of the event. We're scheduled to run for 75 minutes, but we'll certainly aim to finish by 6.30pm UK time at the latest. We are recording the event, and after some editing for sound and video quality, we will circulate the link to all attendees in the next week or so. Finally, we'll be sending around a feedback form tomorrow, and as this is our first public webinar, we would be very grateful to hear from you about your experience. That's all from me. I'll now hand over to Chris Newfield to introduce the event and our speakers. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Stuart. Um, Welcome to this launch and discussion of freedom and unruly history. Uh, I am, as Stuart just said, Chris Newfield. I just recently replaced Louise Braddock as the director of research at the ISRF after working uh, as a professor for 30 years at the Santa Barbara campus of the University of California. Uh, my own research uh, is in critical university studies and American studies, and I have a particular interest in the contradictory psychologies that underlie political systems that are formally democratic. So I must say I was riveted by Annalene's book from start to finish. Uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance to go through it, it's an excellent narrative read uh, and also a good holiday gift for non-academic readers who like big picture takes on major issues. Um, as Stuart uh, said, this is the first of a series of book seminars that the ISRF will have this year. Our fellows have been really very productive this year. They've, they've produced uh, close to 10 books in the past 12 months. And upcoming events will feature some of these, uh, like Oche Onazi's new book, An African Path to Disability Justice, and Kian O'Driscoll's volume called Victory, the Triumph and Tragedy of Just War, among others. Uh, so we're going to be back in touch. Um, our title for this event, Freedom, the One Good Thing That We've Got, uh, partially reflects Stewart's uh, encyclopedic knowledge of the George Michael songbook. Uh, but also Annalene's critique of many of the roles that the idea of freedom has played over 2,500 years of history. Uh, freedom has inspired progressive reforms and revolutions. It has also been developed as an alternative to and a limit on democracy. Many people have been refusing to wear masks during the COVID-19 pandemic in the name of freedom. Many people have opposed the movement for black lives and racial equality in the name of freedom. Those are just two current examples of the momentous and conflicting forces that converge around the concepts of freedom that Annalene takes up. Um, I'm really very happy about the panel that's come together today. Uh, Ranji Manjita Ramgotra, who teaches at SOAS, writes about colonialism, decolonization processes, and the theory of republicanism. Mark Whitehead researches the cognitive manipulations of democratic processes that emerge from neoliberalism. And I'm gonna introduce each of them in turn. Um, all three of them are or have been ISRF fellows. So first up is going to be Annalene. Uh, she'll speak for about 15 minutes and then the two respondents uh, will speak for 10 minutes apiece. Uh, Annalene will have an opportunity to come back and then we'll open it up for questions. So the, this first, Part of the program will run uh, on something like 40, 45 minutes. Um, Annelien de Dang is a professor of history at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. She has also taught at the University of Amsterdam, as well as at Columbia University, Cambridge University, the University of Notre Dame, and UC Berkeley. Her research focuses on the history of political thought in Europe and in the United States from 1700 to the present. She is the author of French political thought thought from Montesquieu to Tocqueville, Liberty in a Leveled Society, which came out at Cambridge in 2008, as well as with many articles and essays on political thought and theory. Her ISRF fellowship project was also called Freedom and Unruly History, 
You may have seen her short overview of her book in Time Magazine, but she also gave an interview to The Nation Magazine in New York, whose title captures one of the themes of her research. What we call freedom has never been about being free. Anna Leanne, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Chris. So is freedom the one good thing that we've got? That's what George Michael asked himself in his hit song from 1990. And it's also the central question I address in my book. The answer to that question, in my view, is both yes and no. And the reason why that's the case is that the meaning of freedom has changed dramatically over time. In a nutshell, my book shows how freedom was transformed from an emancipatory ideal that was used to challenge the rule of political and economic elites into a slogan primarily mobilized to protect the interests of the privileged few. The bulk of my book is devoted to showing that until the early 19th century, people in what we now think of as the West associate political freedom primarily with popular self-government. They had what I call a democratic conception of freedom. A free state was one in which the people ruled itself. Athenian Democrats, Roman plebeians, early modern humanists, and American, Dutch, Polish, and French revolutionaries all believed that the key to preserving political freedom was staving off elite domination. Hence, freedom fighters aimed to introduce political institutions that enhanced popular control over government. In Athens, for instance, most public officials were chosen by lot, and they were in office for only short periods of time. This meant that any male citizen, no matter how obscure their birth or how lowly their station in life, had an equal chance of attaining high office. In addition, Athenians received a stipend to attend the popular assembly where all the important political decisions were. This way, even poor citizens were able to participate in the often day-long meetings as they were compensated for their loss of income. These and similar measures ensured that political power remained in the hands of ordinary citizens. In ancient Rome, wealthy elites maintained a far tighter grip on the political system. But in the second century BCE, amid growing economic inequality, popular dissatisfaction with the status quo increased. Politicians like Tiberius Gracchus campaigned to democratize the system, for instance, by introducing a secret ballot, which promised to lessen the influence of the wealthy over elections. These and similar reforms, the Democrats repeated over and over again, were necessary to preserve Roman liberty as the ruling elite's grip on power threatened to turn all citizens in modern times, the fight for freedom was revived by Renaissance humanists who idolized the ancients. They argued that Europeans were condemned to live as slaves unless they got rid of their kings and queens and reintroduced republican government. This movement culminated in the Atlantic Revolution of the late 18th century, which had been described with good reason as the last act of the Renaissance. Of course, these self-proclaimed freedom fighters often ended up replacing old power structures with new hierarchies, notably of race and gender. Today, we remember the American and French revolutionaries because they introduced new and more broadly popular governments, thus heralding the age of democracy. Yet many of the revolutionaries who protested most loudly against the metaphorical slavery to which they were subjected by autocratic kings and arrogant elites either owned slaves or were involved in the slave trade. At the same time, such hypocrisies were consistently challenged by marginalized groups who were able to turn the revolutionaries' own words against them. As the abolitionist and civil rights activist Frederick Douglass put it, would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty? You have already declared it. In short, for centuries, freedom was used as a mere synonym for democracy. But in the course of the 19th and 20th centuries, this democratic conception of freedom was gradually displaced by a new and very different way of thinking about liberty. Freedom, many came to argue, was not a matter of rule governance. Instead, what determined whether you were free or not was the extent to which you were governed. The smaller the government, the freer you were, regardless of who was in control. This new way of thinking was triggered by a conservative backlash against the rise of democracy. In the 19th and 20th centuries, the democratizing movement booked increasing successes as ruled by traditional elites 
was replaced with more broadly popular governments in both Europe and North America. In the longer run, the problems of democracy also came to be extended to hitherto marginalized groups such as women and black men. But the victories of these democratizing movements also created a powerful counter reaction, a reaction that would lead to a major shift in the thinking about freedom. Democracy, conservatives argued again and again, would not bring freedom for all. After all, even in the most democratic states, power was never exercised by common consent. Rather, in a democracy, the majority of the community ruled over everyone else. If you really cared about freedom, conservatives argued, extending popular control over government was therefore superfluous and even counterproductive. It would lead to majority tyranny. Hence, the only way to preserve freedom was by limiting the sphere of government as much as possible and by empowering counter majoritarian institutions, such as, such as an independent judiciary to protect individuals against majoritarian ogres. When they talked about the tyranny of the majority, it is important to note, conservatives were not primarily thinking about the oppression of vulnerable minorities, such as religious or ethnic minorities. Instead, the majoritarian tyranny they feared, above all, was that of the poor over the rich. They dreaded democracy's redistributive potential. Writing in the wake of 1848, when revolutionaries attempted to introduce manhood suffrage in continental Europe, the British historian Thomas Babington Macaulay spoke for many conservatives when he warned that democracy was incompatible with liberty, as the poor would plunder the rich. Democracy, he pontificated, must, and I quote, destroy liberty or civilization, or both. Similarly, the counter majoritarian institutions conservatives put so much stock in were primarily meant to protect property rights against popular politics. William Howard Taft, for instance, the Chief Justice from 1921 to 1930, spoke for many of his colleagues when he explained that it was up to the federal judiciary, what he called the bulwark of the liberty of individuals, to protect individuals against the aggression of a majority of the electorate, notably by zealously defending their property rights. In short, the idea that freedom depends on the limitation of state power was invented by conservatives to defend elite interests against the rise of democracy. Yet this has been obscured in textbook histories, where this shift in thinking is often attributed instead to long-standing trends in European history. It is often claimed that the growth of religious tolerance in the West, itself an unintended consequence of the Reformation, sparked the emergence of a new way of thinking about liberty as identical with private independence. Another popular narrative attributes the shift in thinking to the emergence of a market economy in the 17th and 18th centuries. This supposedly led to a more enlightened conception of liberty centered on the notion of individual rights that needed protection against state interference. But in fact, neither the Reformation nor the transition to a market economy had much impact on the debate about freedom. So to reiterate, the main argument put forward in my book is that freedom was transformed from an emancipatory ideal into a slogan primarily mobilized to protect the interests of a privileged elite. This story continues to be relevant today. First and foremost, I think it's clear that powerful political actors on the right remain committed to the ideas first developed by 19th century conservatives. Influential conservative organizations such as the Federalist Society, responsible for all of Trump's legal appointments, are committed to the ideal of what they describe as limited constitutional government, arguing that this is the only way to protect individual freedom and traditional values. But it's not just the right. In the wake of the Cold War, the conservative conception of freedom gained wider purchase as international rivalry with the Soviet Union triggered new concerns about the spread of communism. Today, these ideas continue to be surprisingly influential among centrists, even though the Cold War has since long ended. Liberals in the US today tend to be in favor of measures that would enhance ordinary people's control over their political and economic lives. But they rarely talk about that in terms of freedom. That's because they have bought into the conservative conception of freedom as an absence of state intervention. Lena, are you stopping there? That was an absolute 
model of brevity. I have a ton of questions for you, um, but I will I will wait them, save them for later. It looks like we're going to be able to start the questions sooner than we had initially expected. All right, so it's on to Mark Whitehead for the first response. Um, Mark is a professor of human geography at Aberystwyth University, where he holds a personal chair. Um, his early research focused on urban policy under new labor. Uh, more recently, his interest in state power has led him towards developing the first comprehensive account of the rise of psychological forms of governance in the UK state. Uh, this project, which was funded by the Leverhulm Foundation, resulted in the publication of the book, Changing Behaviors on the Rise of the Psychological State, which came out in 2013. He has been funded by the ESRC for a project called Negotiating Neuroliberalism. His ISRF fellowship was called Freedom in a Neuroliberal Age. And he has co-authored a book published with Routledge in 2018 called Neuroliberalism, Behavioral Government in the 20th, 21st Century. It's, um, it's a great book and I absolutely love saying this word <laughs> neuroliberalism, getting double takes. And then also thinking about the way that it, it you know, you, what you talk about emerged from the neoliberalism as the more familiar term. Um, the book takes on the question of how contemporary information and communication technologies have redefined freedom, if that's even still the right word, um, on the cognitive level. So Mark, thank you for being here. Great pleasure. And thanks for that introduction, Chris. And also um, thank you to Annaline for um, this, excellent volume. I feel like I need to start by kind of congratulating you on, on producing this. Uh, I know from personal experience that it's actually quite challenging writing a bad book. So I think to write a very good one is incredible. And I think this is certainly a very impressive volume. If I'm honest with you, I was quite surprised that this volume worked. Uh, you know, it, it kind of combines a span of 2000 years of history with some complex readings and nuanced readings of a whole host of ancient and more contemporary ideas while being engaging and having a human touch. Uh, and, you know, we get a real sense of the kind of human experience of freedom as well. So I just kind of feel it at one level, it shouldn't work, but somehow you managed to pull it off. And I have to say that reading this book over the last month and doing so while kind of checking into CNN to check on, you know, what's happening in Georgia or in Michigan, but also while being on a, a local circuit break in Wales with my family and, you know, experiencing the, the loss of certain forms of liberty has really brought home to me how relevant very ancient ideas are in the 21st century. So just to say that's been incredible to see that. Um, reading the book was ultimately like being able to finally scratch an itch though for me because I've always been really puzzled by the fact that so many people can attach a, a strong commitment to freedom and yet seem to be talking about such radically different things and I think this came home to me certainly in the Brexit referendum which would be kind of interesting to get your perspective on at some point but where you have a group of people who seem to want to liberate themselves from an, a, a seemingly oppressive um, multi-state organisation um, whereas at the one level, I kind of felt I was for Europe precisely because it was liberating in other ways. And I've always found it very difficult to understand how we can all be for freedom and yet seem to be so radically opposed. And I felt this volume really kind of explains how that difference exists ideologically, but also how that difference has essentially been with us for at least kind of 2000 years. You know, it's not sort of some new invention. It's kind of fairly intrinsic, it seems, to the human condition. So thank you for enabling me to kind of finally scratch that itch. You know, it's sort of intellectually, it was, it was really interesting. I just want to do two things briefly. I want to reflect on what I think were the main provocations of the volume for me. And then I also want to raise some of my own provocations for you, Annaline, which kind of emerge, I suppose, out of my own work and also, I suppose, out of my interest as a geographer, which is my disciplinary background. So for me, the key provocations of the volume really um, relate to this kind of the way in which it brings to the fore the recurring historical trialectic, if I can use that term, of freedom. And the trialectic of freedom, I think, is the idea of moral autonomy, our ability to kind of make decisions autonomously civic liberty, the idea of just being able to be left to our own devices, and democratic 
democratic participation. And I think this book is kind of brings the, this trialectic of, of discourses around freedom into focus. And we see that sometimes these seem to be aligned, but generally there seems to be a, a a misalignment between these visions of freedom and they often seem to be working in contradistinction to each other. Initially as I was reading this volume I did have a moment where I kind of felt is freedom a category mistake? You know is it a concept which is actually covering far too much if it can kind of cover the full sweep of the political spectrum and, and it, it, you know does it mean anything if we can all be talking about the same thing? But as I went through the volume, I felt that the most interesting parts were when we see these kind of virtuous alignments between these different modalities of freedom. So it might be in fifth century Greece or the early Roman Republic or the work of Locke and Mill or even Switzerland at certain points in time. Um, and those were kind of where I kind of felt there is a sort of a sense in which we can actually see these alignments. Or if you like, you know, you can have, of course, civil liberty under a monarchical system. But why not, if you like, eat our freedom cake and have it? And if you like, live in a, a society where we have civil, strong civil liberty, but also democratic government. And those two things actually can support each other effectively. So you, you really pulled me around, I think, to sort of buying into the idea of what freedom can do. So for me, the two key insights of the volume, I felt, were the idea that the, the different modalities of freedom shouldn't necessarily be thought of as a zero sum game we can enjoy our liberty and maintain our democratic institutions of government. And those two things shouldn't pull in opposite directions. In fact, are much more effective when they don't. But I felt another powerful insight of the volume was the way in which we see the arbitrary exploitation of certain visions of freedom over others. And so this relates, I suppose, to a kind of 18th and 19th century views on personal liberty as opposed to democratic freedom. And it seemed to me the story was partly about those who are, are most free <laughs> seem to get to determine what is free for other people. And I found that really interesting. So those are the things that, you know, I felt provoked me. Now, if I can have the opportunity of provoking you, Annalene, in, in a very gentle way, I should say, with um, four um, observations. And I don't expect you to be able to answer these fully. <laughs> you may actually find them to be nonsensical in some ways but these are my provocations for you. Number one, I'm very interested in the relationship between economic and political freedom and I felt that this book was primarily focused on obviously more formal aspects of political freedom whereas I feel that the, the economic is often I suppose associated with a kind of an informality of freedom it's kind of the stuff that we just do but we don't really think about it and yet certainly in my own life working in the knowledge economy it's it is the economy that feels most oppressive <laughs> to me whereas political institutions do seem once removed in some ways and I know I never particularly feel either my civil liberties or my ability to democratically participate are problematic to me on a day-to-day -day basis so I kind of wondered the extent to which economic the account of economic freedom needs its own history or whether in a sense it's one that has to be told in lockstep with the formal political ideas that you're talking about um, so that was my first provocation my second were I suppose the questions around myths and stories because I think a lot of the book is talking about kind of myths and stories around freedom that different generations have told themselves but it seems to me at the moment that in terms of myth making, the right seem much better than the left. And this isn't just about freedom, but a whole series of things. So liberty is true freedom. You know, popular democracy is socialism. You know, we see that in, in what's going on in Florida. And I just wonder the extent to which we can imagine more popular stories that can be mobilised to tell the story of democratic freedom and its value and how it means something to people. Because I think it can often seem quite lofty and quite formal and quite idealised. And so I'm just interested to, to think about what stories we might be able to tell there. My third provocation is a very personal one. I've been interested in the emergence of more softly paternal forms of state action recently. So in the context of the state being more minimalist, many governments have sought to use sort of softer forms of paternalism, often at a psychological level, which have enabled them to intervene more in people's everyday lives, while not being seen to be overly um, controlling in terms of personal liberty. My question to you is, is that a kind of an alignment of freedom, a negotiation of freedom that might 
you know, be something that's desirable? Or is it the ultimately messy compromise when civil liberties have won out and we end all we end up with is a kind of a, an avuncular state just nudging and prodding us and it's it's very unsatisfactory so I just wanted to get your response um, to, to that development as well and my last provocation I suppose is my most depressing one if that's okay so Chris mentioned my fascination with neoliberalism and I do wonder whether having told all this history of 2000 years if in the neoliberal era we're kind of we've got the worst of all worlds so freedom becomes an oppressive force in itself as in the civil realm we kind of are anxiously kind of taking care of ourselves because there aren't these safety nets in place so freedom becomes this kind of as Foucault said this context within which we're constantly working on ourselves because we can't afford to fail because if we do there's nothing to protect us but at the same time, the, the democratic realm is so corporatized and monetized that we don't feel we can engage with that in a meaningful way either. So a slightly depressive note there. So those are my provocations. Can I just share one little story with you to conclude, if that's OK? I, I, in the um, your at the end of the book, you have a little bit of a sort of a set of acknowledgments. And you tell the story of seeing that Barack Obama poster with the Hitler moustache in 2009. So I had a similar moment to that in 2008. I remember when John McCain was campaigning for the US election. He was at a Harley Davidson rally and the people were revving their bike engines. And McCain said, that is the sound of freedom. And I was really struck by that because, you know, I could see this kind of myth of the kind of the open road, the motorbike, the kind of, the, you know, the, the civil liberty of the motorbike. And all I could think about was air pollution, climate change. And all the kind of you know illiberal things that are associated with that. You may be aware of the work of William Ophuls, who's talked a lot about how liberty, in a sense, is really a product of our age of abundance. While resources have been plentiful, liberty hasn't been a problem. In the future, it seems more likely that with climate change and resource shortages, that liberty will be more constrained. What your book told me, I think, is that we, even though we might have a more constrained future, it doesn't mean that it has to be one that isn't defined by a form of freedom. So that's what I'd just like to finish on. That's lovely, Mark. Thank you very much. A uh, third, uh, and then we will turn go back to uh, Annalene for responses to these comments, is uh, Manjin, Manjita Ramgotra who lectures in political theory in the Department of Politics and International Studies at SOAS University of London. She studied politics and French at the University of Saskatchewan in Canada, lived and worked in France for a number of years, and then wrote a PhD in political theory at the LSE on the conservative roots of republicanism in the history of Western political thought. More recently, Manjit's research has turned to examining republicanism in 20th century post-colonial movements Notably in the founding of the Indian Republic, Manjit is a strong advocate of decolonizing the curriculum and is co-editing a new political theory textbook called Deconsidering Political Thinkers. I think it's a very tactful title, I think. Um, among her publications is one that particularly struck me called Post-Colonial Republicanism and the Revival of a Paradigm. Uh, she suggests that the 1960s revival of Republican theory, I think of Pocock and Clinton Skinner, uh, in the global north may have been in part a way of filtering or filtering out decolonizing movements and what they represented in the global south. And then in the same piece, she turns to analyzing Nehru's modification of Republican traditions as part of the decolonization of India and the building of that new state. Um, she is a current fellow at the ISRF where her project is called Postcolonial Republicanism, the Indian Founding and its Impact, which is on its way to becoming a book. And I also wanna thank you, Manji, for reading Annalene's book with me. We had a, a two person reading group and it was almost like having a private tutor in political theory. So I was, I was really happy to have that experience. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I was also very happy to um, <laughs> read the book with you and have that experience, and I learned a lot as well. So um, thank you, Stuart and Lawrence, for organizing this event, and thank you, Chris, for inviting me to speak. And a huge thank you to Annalene for writing such a fabulous book and making this event possible. 
The book is beautifully written and very meticulously researched and detailed. It takes readers through a broad conceptual history that is told not only through the writings of key thinkers, but also through objects, art, political action, and events, inviting us to think more widely about the meaning, articulation, and practice of freedom. The symbolic cap of liberty, signifying initially the liberation of slaves in Rome, and later political liberty is a case in point. As is the Spartan envoys to Persia, who contrasted the liberty to be self-governing to that of the despotic rule of the Persian prince. This book uncovers how an important strand of thinking about political liberty to rule oneself and to answer to no one emerges at certain moments in time through radical democratic struggles, but is never quite actualized as it is eclipsed by more conservative, aristocratic and elitist conceptions of freedom that promoted the security to live without the interference of governing institutions. Annalene argues that the notion of individual rights and freedoms has suppressed the radical democratic political liberty to have an active role in self-governing. Her book details how we got to this point. The argument that there are two notions of freedom, a more active and participatory one that opposes a passive one, where people want to be free to pursue their own lives without any interference from the state, runs throughout the history of Western political thought and activism. This history has been variously presented and argued by Benjamin Constant, Isaiah Berlin, John Pocock, and Quentin Skinner. Constant contrasts the ancient and modern freedom, which Berlin reads in terms of positive and negative liberty, whereas Pocock and Skinner lament the loss of the classical and neo-Roman Republican tradition that promotes the active participation in ruling in a free state. They criticize modern individual negative freedom and rights for privatizing freedom and keeping the people outside of the realm of public deliberation and politics. I read Annaline's book as part of this broader school of Republican thought that sees the language of liberalism, contract and natural rights as eclipsing the participatory language of Republican liberty. At the same time, at the same time, it is not reducible to this. Annaline's story is somewhat different as she includes different actors. A large part of this book examines the Atlantic revolutions and asks why the promises of full egalitarian liberty were not realized after the American, French, and Haitian revolutions. This leads to a study of the counter-revolutionary thinking that considered democratic rule tyrannical and in need of moderation. Thus, she contends that the conception of freedom from state interference was pushed as a more important and substantive freedom than the liberty to participate in legislative processes. Giving the people legislative power was precarious as they could be despotic or totalitarian in their rule. Therefore, legislative power was shared between two chambers. The independent judiciary was granted the authority to scrutinize legislation. These measures were meant to temper the tyranny of the majority. In other words, the radical, egalitarian, democratic elements of the cult of freedom were made subject to elite control through these mechanisms. Overall, I agree with the argument that the negative conception of freedom from state interference is bereft of the positive element to share in controlling public affairs. However, I do not think that the dualistic conception of these two types, two types of liberty are necessarily antithetical, nor that one wins out over the other. The notion of being free from arbitrary, arbitrary state power is important. In Rome, the tribunes of the people were established to stop magistrates from arbitrarily punishing common people, which led to the development of due process. In our time, Black Lives Matter is a movement about protecting black lives from the arbitrary abuse of police power. 
the right to be protected from such interference in one's home from being stalked and searched due to the color of one's skin is very important. We need only look to the abuse of power that cost the lives of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd to understand this. Moreover, the enjoyment of this freedom does not necessarily mean that one should forego the liberty to, participating, to participate in ruling. One needs both. There is a long tradition of thinking that incorporates on an unequal basis these two types of freedom in the mixed Republican constitution. The people are granted the freedom to live in security from arbitrary power and the landed nobility enjoy the authority to rule and make laws that have jurisdiction over their private property. This is seen as virtue in Republican theories and in Rome, the nobility had virtue. The people had representatives who could participate in making legislation only through their negative power to veto the propositions made by the Senate. That is to say, republics included both types of freedom, but distributed these unequally across social classes. It was feared that the power of the people would become despotic, but at the same time, the establishment or wealthy property social classes did not want to give up their authority and hence they limited the popular voice. The revolutionary thrust of the 18th century for radical democracy that pushed the boundaries to include more people in political processes was tempered by more conservative thinking that only partially incorporated a small portion of the people that portion excluded women, people of color, the working classes, and slaves. What is refreshing about Annaline's book is that she includes some of these marginal voices to illustrate the reemergence of the cult of freedom. Notably, in her discussion of Atlantic revolutions, she pays attention to the Haitian revolution of black slaves against their white European masters. She also looks at women in the French Revolution, notably Olympe de Gouges, who composed a Declaration of the Rights of Women and Citizens in 1791, and black rights activists such as Frederick Douglass. I want to push you more on this, Annaline, as I think these are voices that challenge both the conservative and the democratic positionalities of the men who usually have both space and voice in politics and the production of knowledge. It would be great to see a deeper elaboration of the marginalized voices that contest and expand the boundaries of political participation and how we organize difference and inclusion in our structures, in our political structures and spaces. These sources of knowledge grapple with these issues from the perspective and experience of the oppressed. Not only do they challenge mainstream ways of thinking through questions of freedom and political institutions, but they also present normative ideas on how to create structures that would make good the liberty to participate on a more meaningful level in ruling institutions and laws, rather than simply conforming to existing structures which is where inequality gets embedded structurally and needs shaking up. Furthermore, these voices are really important in this discussion of what radical liberty means, especially when we discuss it as being the opposite of slavery and not being subject to the arbitrary rule or will of another. In Studies of Freedom, I think it is important to examine in depth the activists and theorists who write about their experiences of oppression and their conceptualizations of freedom. This cuts across as well to anti-colonial resistance of the early 20th century. In some of my research, as Chris mentioned, I asked why Pocock and Skinner in their revival of, an, of a neglected Republican tradition did not examine the ideas of self-rule and independence in movements of decolonization that took place in their time. Perhaps they were aware of this and maybe even inspired in their un uncovering of Republican self-rule, 
but their focus is on the transatlantic and European articulations of republicanism regarding moral personality, human agency, freedom from domination, and the virtue to rule over circumstance and change. Both historians criticized the ahistorical and philosophical approach of historians of political thought who read a modern history of liberalism and rights discourse back into the history of Western political ideas. Simultaneously, the post-colonial moment in which this Republican paradigm was excavated abounded with Republican rhetoric, calls to participate and take control of politics for the good of all, to contest the politics of the powers that be, and to push the boundaries to include more people in the political were in full swing, notably in the American civil rights, feminist, gay liberation, and anti-war movements. Yet this political activism and civic spiritedness were not included in the reconstruction of republicanism. I am hard pressed to understand why. Again, it is great you start to do this in your book, yet I think it could be for further developed perhaps in a volume two. You do note that your study is about Western understandings. However, I do not think that this can be separated from wider contexts in which many of these ideas developed. Even classical conceptions of the free state are juxtaposed to the idea of Persian despotism. And the languages of liberty and natural rights emerge in a moment of European colonial expansion and empire but also many of these anti-colonial, anti-racist, and feminist thinkers are situated in the West, yet they are not seen as integral to Western thinking. In addition, many transatlantic republics were expansive. The anti-colonial conception of self-rule opposes the domination of these republics. So I think there are two narratives, the transatlantic one and the anti-colonial one. I also see the Republican conception of liberty as expansive. So there are categories and hierarchies of liberty at home and domination abroad, which is also a sort of freedom and power to rule over others through empire. Finally, I want to touch on the constant dichotomy of ancient modern uh, freedom, which I think is a story of modernity, liberalism and individual liberty where the ancient is not simply a reference to the classical world, but also to the traditional and so-called backward colonized peoples. There is a justification that the civilized modern Europeans who are free can dominate over the uncivilized developing traditional and often despotic societies of Asia, Africa, and the Americas for their own benefit so that they can be educated in modernity to learn to be self-ruling, independent through property ownership and free. This binary also presents an understanding of time. To be modern is to be part of a contemporaneous world replete with the knowledge, technology and modes of being from that world. To be ancient is to belong not only to another time frame but rather to another world that is not necessarily on par with recent knowledges and technologies. So I think this binary of ancient modern freedom not only distinguishes between the despotic tendencies of radical revolutionary democratic liberty and conservative counter-revolutionary anti-democratic freedom, but also it serves to differentiate colonized from Western societies as well as anti-colonialist and nationalist movements from Western notions of liberal democracy and freedom. I have taken the liberty to extend your study to another realm. I want to conclude by saying that your book has given me lots of food for thought. So thank you very much. So, um, is it okay, Chris, if I uh, respond? Yeah, quickly? yeah, it's back to you, Annalie. I'm sorry, I was muted. Yeah, thank you very much, Manji. That was fabulous. And Annalie, yeah, please respond and then we'll open it up. Um, well, let me start by saying um, that um, I, I, I want to thank uh, both Mark and Manjit for their uh, truly uh, excellent uh, questions and um, very 
thought-provoking. I, I couldn't have wished for a more generous um, or discerning readers. So I'm, I'm really extremely uh, flattered and happy that you took the time to read my book. Um, uh, and that I'm going to try to uh, answer your questions um, as briefly as possible. And unfortunately, that means that I won't be able to do them uh, just as entirely um, because um, most of your questions would require me um, responding for hours on end <laughs> to give you just a little bit of a, uh, of a beginning of an answer. Um, so this will necessarily be um, more of a sketch than a, than a true response. Um, so in response to Mark's uh, questions, um, I, I, I wanted to pick up on your uh, question about the relationship between uh, economic and uh, political uh, freedom. So one of the um, one of the stories that I um, try to tell in my um, in in the book is how um, you know for for you know the larger part of the of the story uh, this uh, tradition of democratic freedom is really focused on establishing freedom in the political realm. Uh, but what I also try to show is that towards the uh, middle of the 19th century, um, thinkers that you know arguably can be said to be drawing on this tradition, um, and I'm thinking here of the emerging socialist movement, but also of uh, you know, the uh, um, uh, contingent movements such as uh, radicalism, uh, and later in the late 19th century, American populism, um, they start arguing, uh, look, um, establishing freedom in the political sphere isn't enough. If we want to be truly free, uh, we need to do something else. We need to um, extend popular control, not just over the political sphere, but also over the uh, economic sphere. Um, and I think um, there's a couple of reasons why that happens fairly late in the day. Uh, one reason I think is that um, for most of human history, those who were in a position to leave us records of their thoughts on freedom Tended to be people who, you know, had a certain amount of economic independence. Uh, hence, uh, unlike you know you and I have to say, I share your feeling that you know sort of my immediate economic environment is sort of uh, more of an infringement of my of my liberty. Um, oftentimes, I'm in a more distant political sphere. But so I think that that was different for uh, for you know for these earlier uh, thinkers. Uh, but another thing that happened in the, in the 19th century is obviously that the uh, industrial uh, revolution uh, leaves, you know, wrecks uh, havoc, and uh, you know, it is it really changes the nature of work, right? It means that it, it, this transition from agrarian society to industrial society means, um, um, as uh, historians like E.P. Thompson have shown, that you know, not just that people start doing different kinds of work, but also that their work becomes very much um, more highly, you know, so much more highly regimented. And I think that that is one of the reasons why, why that, you know, gets this debate going about um, how we need to, um, how we need, um, you know, how, how freedom isn't just, isn't something that, you know, simply happens in the political sphere, but that also requires us to uh, extend popular control over, um, um, over, um, over the economic sphere. Um, and then your sort of uh, second um, question in regards to uh, myth making. So I, I completely agree, and that's one of the things that I try to sort of uh, explain in my book um, how that happened. Uh, but I completely agree with you that um, it seems that um, the left has sort of uh, relinquished um, you know this uh, this ideal of freedom, and um, the right has become quite successful in. Um, uh, in sort of, um, you know, and, and that's, so my book is intended in, you know, one of the major goals that I try to achieve with the book is to explain how this, how this actually happened. Um, and I think that's a story that starts in the 19th century, but I also think that this Cold War context has been extremely important uh, in that uh, regard. Um, on the other hand, I do think that right now, uh, in particular in the US, uh, and to a lesser extent, I would argue in Britain, there's been, you know, some sort of um, revival of um, democratic socialism, and what I find really interesting is that uh, people like Bernie Sanders um, do make very, you know, explicit attempts to reclaim the concept of freedom for uh, this, you know, socialist, newly emerging socialist movement. 
Um, and another thing that I try to do in my book is, you know, is to sort of, you know, say, well, look, you know, you, you know, you, there are good historical reasons for arguing that actually socialism is a, a, a tradition focused on democratic freedom. Um, then, with regard to your question about nudging, uh, I find it a really fascinating development, and and I think this sort of um, is another example of how, in this day and age, uh, centrist liberals have really given up on this idea of freedom. Um, I mean, the, that whole discourse, uh, the Sunstein, uh, Gestaltstein's, uh, you know, liberal paternalism, and so you know, and I think you know, I think that there's a danger in that because I think again that it you know leaves uh, you know it leaves an opening for conservative politicians to argue. You know, to argue to reiterate again that you know what they're doing, that's you know, that's what freedom is all about, deregulation. And what the left is doing, that's paternalism. Um, and again, you know, um I, I think that's you know not a I, I don't think that it's a very smart political strategy. Um, because I, you know, in the end of the day, I think lots of people are still quite attached to this idea that we want to live free lives, so just you know, giving up on that ideal. And calling yourself a liberal paternalist, um, I'm not a spin doctor, but it, it just doesn't seem like a, a good idea uh, to me. <laughs> uh, but again, I mean, thank you. Uh, I, I really learned so much uh, from your questions and, and comments. Um, Banjit, in, in response to your uh, questions, um, so um, I, I, I did try to, so one of the sort of uh, things I ran into in my research is that try to describe this tradition of what I call democratic freedom. Um, and I try to sort of uh, trace that back all the way to ancient Greece. Um, but um, at the same time, what you see is that throughout history, individuals um, who call themselves freedom fighters, um, who claim that they're sort of you know, trying to you know, bring freedom for all, uh, you know, they're saying all these things, but what they're doing in actual reality to us, doesn't seem, you know, at all, you know, like they're bringing freedom for all. In fact, what is more, more striking for us is that they ended up excluding uh, so many people, continue to continue to exclude so many people from, uh, from power and, and therefore from what they themselves describe as, as freedom. Um, and I do try to show at the same time that, um, you know, that those sort of, um, those hypocrisies, we can act, because I think we can describe them as hypocrisies, that they're contested by marginalized voices, and I'm, you know, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm happy that you noticed that uh, because I did, you know, I did really, um, you know, I did really do a lot of work to try to weave that into the narrative. Um, but I think what I also tried to do was to weave a, a marginalized or a, a set of marginalized voices into the narrative. Voices that weren't ne um, marginalized necessarily uh, because they belonged to different racial uh, and gender um, groups from you know, the groups that traditionally um, you know, have been in power, but that have been marginalized because um, they were fighting for, um, uh, you know, for, for, for what I uh, earlier described as economic freedom. So, and, and I think that that's another sort of a tradition that has been um, unfairly uh, neglected or that's so, so, so I would argue that we shouldn't just try to weave back into the story of freedom those marginalized voices in the sense of marginalized women and marginalized people of color. But I think there, there are also good reasons to try to weave back into the story of freedom this fight for economic uh, freedom. Um, uh, um, so, so, you know, so I, I, I try to do those things at the same uh, time. Uh, that did mean that I had to sort of leave other things out of the story, and I think you're completely right to call me out on that. Um, so I think you're absolutely right that there's a really important uh, and interesting story to be told of how this democratic conception of freedom uh, was picked up and used in new and unexpected ways by um, anti-colonial movements. Um, and and I, I also um, I completely agree with you that you know, just saying, well, that's not part of the Western tradition, 
but that is not but that is you know an unfair cop out because I, I agree with you that that would be um, a you know strangely narrow definition of what the Western tradition would be all about. Um, so in in all honesty, I don't have a good answer to give to you uh, except that uh, after working on this book for ten years, <laughs> um, I sort of felt that you know I'd given it all that I had, and that this was uh, a story to be told perhaps by somebody else, perhaps by my in another in another book. Um, so I think I'm going to stop here and uh, uh, give the floor to uh, to Stuart or Chris. Yeah, Alien, thank you very much for that. Um, Lars is going to stage um, a number of the questions that we have in the Q and A box, and it is by no means too late to add additional ones. So please feel free to stack them up. That's right. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, let me just very quickly explain how this next maybe 15 minute segment is going to work. The, the primary aim will be to read out questions that the audience members have, have posed in the Q&A box. If you have any questions, I would, I would encourage you to add them to the Q&A box um, soon. You can find the Q&A box at the, at the bottom of your screen and just type your question in there. I'd also encourage you to keep questions short and also I will prioritize questions over, over sort of comment um, or, or sort of um, you know, feedback framed um, questions. I'm gonna start with one by uh, Sarah Gabe, which, uh, which thanks Annalene for a brilliant talk and then goes on to say the following. Anybody can read along with me as I read it out. <laughs> the so-called triumph of democracy after after the popular revolutions coincides with pacification of democracy, that is with a reinterpretation of democracy as a peaceful and stable regime. This is in stark contrast to what democracy has meant since antiquity until then, a chaotic or even unruly mm -hmm. and potentially violent form of government. I was wondering whether you believe that the transformation of a democratic concept of freedom as self-government into a concept of liberty as the limitation of state power has anything to do with the disappearance of conflict from the heart of the concept of democracy? Could democracy or popular rule only triumph because it lost its conflictual or anarchic connotations or are those distinct developments in modern political thought? So back to you, Annalie. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Sarah. That's, that's a really terrific question. Um, I mean, I would have to give a lot more thought to this question because it is, I think it's a very uh, deep and important question, but, but my uh, gut response would be to say that I'm not entirely sure that I agree with you um, that the you know, popular revolutions uh, ended with a, uh, with, with, a, with a situation where democracy uh, became a peaceful and stable regime. Um, at least in the European context, uh, what we see is that um, throughout the 19th century, uh, this you know, struggle for democracy remains extremely uh, violent um, and, um, um, and chaotic and unruly. Uh, and in a way, you could argue that that is also the case uh, for the US, uh, where um, you know, there are good reasons to argue that um, democracy wasn't really achieved in the US until the 1960s, um, right, when the civil rights movement managed to get uh, the vote extended. Um, to uh, black people in the south, so so I'm you know I'm a little hesitant to um, to agree with you that uh, democracy um, you know that that there was some sort of a long uh, peaceful period of democratic stability after uh, after the popular uh, revolutions of the late 18th century. Um, at the same time, I do think that in that struggle for democracy. Mm -hmm. Uh, sort of these uh, conservative forces that were arguing um, uh, that, that were arguing uh, for uh, you know, liberty in the sense of uh, limited government that they they managed to achieve a couple of important victories even though they lost the war in the end um, and um, I think the most sort of uh, important institutional results of that struggle was that they managed to introduce uh, a number of institutions uh, that we now describe as uh, counter majoritarian institutions and that um, in, in that sense um, um, 
you know, the, the thrive of democracy in both Europe and the United States that, that was sort of achieved in the wake of a, a compromise with these uh, more conservative movements that uh, tried to limit sort of uh, popular support. Thanks very much, Honorine. I'm going to move on to a um, to a second question that's that's been upvoted, um, which is by Kay Hiruta, um, and it and it goes as follows: How did you deal when when writing the book with linguistic complications? You wrote your book in English, which has liberty and freedom. But as you know, other European languages have one word for liberty and freedom, while the Greeks had eleutheria and never spoke about liberty or freedom. What difficulties did these linguistic differences create for you to tell a story of freedom covering multiple linguistic communities? Uh, yeah, that's another uh, great, uh, great question. Um, so lots of people ask me uh, whether uh, they're, you know, whether um, there are reasons to distinguish between liberty and freedom. Um, I ended up, you know, just following um, regular native usage, uh, which um, you know, treats liberty uh, and freedom as as synonyms, uh, basically. Um, then, um, you know, with regard to the fact that I uh, read sources in many uh, different languages, um, yeah. So if you, yeah. If you look at these, um, I guess the I guess the short answer is that it never really, uh, yeah, that it was never a real a real issue. So, um, you know, the 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 Greek concept of illiteria, um, you know, might have had slightly different connotations. Uh, from uh, or the Roman word libertas, but in in many ways uh, these concepts, I, I'm not really interested in sort of um, dictionary definitions per se, but I was interested in the way in which these words were employed um, in uh, in you know in political struggles. And there you see that both in Rome and in ancient Greece, to give you just one example, uh, the concept eleutheria and the concept libertas were used in to make fairly similar political moves, aka to plead for greater democracy. Thanks, Amreen. Um, I'm going to read out a question by Eva Daly, which opens by saying that she's looking forward to reading your book. And she says, my research looks at freedoms for under 18s, both personal freedoms and political participation also. Obviously, there are complex issues for this group as they are generally disenfranchised and defined as legally incapacitated. I draw a lot on Feynman's vulnerability theory and also the social model of disability in my work to argue how children's lack of freedom is in large part socially constructed. And then she asks, do you explicitly consider this question of, of um, age and, and legality and freedom in your book? And if not, could you could you speak to it briefly? Yeah, that's another really interesting uh, question. Um, so. Um, I think I think so. I don't explicitly consider this uh, question of um, age limit uh, in the book, although there there was debate about that um, in in earlier periods as well. Um, but I think there is sort of an interesting analogy uh, to be drawn here, and that is the analogy with debates about female uh, suffrage. Um, so what you see uh, happening uh, right from the start uh, already in ancient Greece. Um, you know, in when you get these uh, contexts where you have democratic regimes, uh, but that exclude women from uh, from uh, the suffrage, the argument is always to put women in the same box as children. So the claim that they made about women was that um, um, you know women, you know, they're simply not independent beings; they're completely dependent on men, and that's because men are sort of fully grown rational human beings and women are sort of, I mean, women, you know, it was acknowledged that they weren't exactly children, but they were definitely put in the same box. So what I would argue that you can sort of, um, or that you might want to conclude from that potentially, um, is that, you know, seeing that those arguments were used to disenfranchise groups that we now think of as, you know, you know it's shocking and unacceptable for us that they're excluded from the franchise that we might you know, that, that might also make it suspicious um, um, about, about arguments to exclude um, you know, different groups, in your case, children, uh, from uh, 
code of verification. Thanks, Annalene. I think we have um, time for maybe one more question or, or perhaps squeezing in two if we, if we keep them brief. So I'm, I'm just going to, to ask a question by Saul Newman, which goes as follows. How does Lord Boethi's conception of voluntary servitude fit in with this story of freedom? He says we can only understand freedom firstly through its voluntary abandonment. Uh, yeah, I, I love La Boisi. Um, he's a really interesting, interesting thinker, um, and I have a section on him in my book. And so I would argue that he's very much in this democratic tradition. Um, for instance, he refers uh, explicitly to the these ancient Greek and Roman republics, um, and you know he sort of bemoans the fact um, that uh, modern Europeans, uh, Frenchmen of his own day and age, that they've sort of abandoned the struggle for freedom that he thought was you know, characteristic uh, of ancient Greece and, and Rome. Um, but I think he's interesting for another reason as well, and that is, he, you know, he goes one step beyond the you know, complaining about the disappearance of liberty, and he also tries to explain why this happened. And then he has this really interesting theory that the reason why this happened was um, because elites sort of conspired with, uh, with, with, with uh, kings and queens, uh, well, in the French case, uh, kings, um, to sort of, um, uh, you know, to sort of exclude everybody else from, uh, from ruling. Um, so there's, you know, he, he's one of the few thinkers that I've encountered, um, uh, except for uh, Harrington, maybe, who tries to come up um, with sort of a theory for why uh, popular government had disappeared so completely from the European scene for so long <laughs> after the demise of the Roman Republic. Thanks, Donnelly. Um, I'm going to take a, a question that here is marked as anonymous, but that I happen to know comes comes from the ISRF team. But what I'm going to do is 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 make it slightly broader. The question is: Could you speak a little bit about? how the, the role of civil rights movements of the past few centuries fitted to this, to this question. But I'd like to broaden it and ask you why it was that your book ends in, in chapter six, shortly after the Second World War. You, you speak a little bit about Hayek and you speak a little bit about Isaiah Berlin, but, but that's where your, your story ends. What that means is that you can't speak uh, at any length about decolonial movements or civil rights rights movements or, or, or other struggles over the concept of, of freedom. So could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, great question. Um, so what, what triggered my interest uh, in this topic uh, and the reason why I wanted to do, why I ended up writing this history and um, sort of doing 10 years, <laughs> spending 10 years doing so, um, was that, uh, you know, as a postdoc, I lived in the US and um, uh, at the time, Barack Obama had just been elected. And, um, you know, he was, as you may remember, he was trying to reform the healthcare system. Um, and one of the sort of proposals that he made was to introduce something called the binding mandate or the individual mandate, which sort of meant that everybody would have been obligated um, to buy healthcare. And eventually, that mandate was also passed. Uh, but that, you know, created this huge outcry. Um, you know, why this is a, a, you know, fundamental attack on American freedom and it's going to, you know, bring us socialist totalitarianism. And as a European, I simply, at, at first, I simply couldn't understand, uh, you know, why somebody believes that this was a, a plausible argument. But then when I started thinking about it, I started noticing that even in Europe, even though Europeans thought, you know, they're not, you know, they're not as eager to talk about freedom and their, you know, attacks on freedom as Americans did, even in, in a European context, the concept of uh, liberty is usually used uh, um, to sort of uh, decry uh, new government rules and regulations. And, you know, that, you know, so that sort of got me wondering, how did we end up with that, um, with that, with that concept? Um, and sort of, um, yeah, so, and so in trying to answer that question, I, I ended up, um, you know, arguing that this concept is invented in the early 19th century by these conservatives, but it then becomes sort of um, generalized, it becomes more broadly accepted in the wake of uh, the Cold War, 
uh, and that, you know, um, I argue uh, is, is because of kind of this, this generalized um, anxiety about the state, which develops in the context of that uh, rivalry with the Cold War. Um, and, you know, so, so that's, so that's, and so that's the question I really wanted to answer now. I can, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's more to be said about this, right? Um, I think there's, I think the post-war period is incredibly interesting from an intellectual perspective. Uh, and I think, you know, I, you know, I, I actually think a whole new book could be written about this. <laughs> but, um, so, you know, because, you know, the, the larger question that that then raises is then why did the Cold War continue to have this influence on our thinking for so long, even for so long after, um, you know, after the fall of the Berlin Wall? And I think part of the answer is that this has to do with intellectual laziness. Um, uh, but I, I think it's not just uh, that. But um, uh, anyway, so. Um, I, I end with the Cold War because I see that as a sort of main caesura, uh, you know, sort of the end of that very uh, democratic freedom. Uh, but you know, I, at the same time, I acknowledge that that is perhaps a little bit too you know, simplistic of you, and that there's lots more to be said about that post war period. Thanks very much, Anneline. Um, I'm afraid that's that's all the time that we have for for questions from the audience. And apologies to anybody who's who's not had their their question read out. Um, shall I hand back to you, Chris? Uh, yeah, I mean, I thought the questions, <laughs> the Q&As were, were really good, and I'm sorry that we don't have more time to, to address them. I'm just wondering if the panelists would like to say anything to each other before we wrap it up. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I... Again, I, I wanted to thank uh, Mark and Manjit for, for yeah, first and foremost for <laughs> for reading my book, <laughs> uh, and second for um, for asking these these really great uh, questions, uh, and and Manjit in particular, um, uh, you you know you've almost got almost got me convinced that I need to write <laughs> this second <laughs> second volume. <laughs> I'm not sure my uh, wife will be very happy about that. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I mean I. I you, you've made me realize how much more there is to be said about this subject. Yeah, just, just to say from my point of view, um, I really appreciate your responses to the question because I think it, it's helped me understand more of your kind of normative perspective on this. So your reflections in particular on soft paternalism are very much in line with my thinking and, and, and it sort of, I think, expresses a little bit of what Lars was talking about there, about what we take from this moving forward. So that was really helpful. So thank you. No, and me too. Thank you very much for the um, for your responses to my question. I'm glad I've got you thinking about volume two because I have to say it is a really good read. Annalene's book is excellent, and um, as I said at the start, it's beautifully written. Um, but no, I think there are. It's interesting what you just said about you know ending in the Cold War, not moving into um post cold war and um the end of history type um discussions because i think that's actually um with the end of the cold war that's when a lot of this scholarship begins to come to the fore and really grows up and that's when we start to come out of these locked in modes about what is the canon and who should we read and um and also questions of empire. Um, I saw in the chat, someone said that Skinner was of the 60s period when, um, you know, anti-colonialist period. And so that was there then, but I think it's really come to the fore in um, universities and how we look at knowledge now. But anyway, thank you very much. Sorry, that was a long-winded <laughs> response. Well, that's great. I, I just want to wrap up by noticing um, or noting my experience of um, reading the book, which was that I was really struck by around this question of freedom by the way that the West, Western societies has refused to so many people the thing that it claims to stand for itself, but refusing it to people both inside its own societies and also outside. So on the one hand, I felt um, discouraged by what seemed to be 2,500 years of certain kind of hypocrisy. Uh, on the other hand, I, I also I felt that you were recovering a much stronger conceptual tradition that 
lives within that and that people within the West, as well as people who were confronted by the West and the outside through colonialism and, and other movements have, have extracted from it and, and reworked from it. And I, I agree with what Manjeet said in particular about the way that freedom is um, being defined also by via contestation from the position of those that are oppressed by the West the, and that the things that the interaction among all of these societies is a, a major source of the possibility of democratizing the societies that are engaged in the, you know, sort of in colonial acts. And then also um, very much in agreement with Mark, um, who's really interesting suggestion about green futures may require, I, I'm, I'm kind of pushing this bit over the edge of what you said, uh, may require a shift away from freedom altogether as this kind of normatively central concept because of the ease with which freedom defaults to its negative defensive version and that we have to move instead towards forms of just collaboration and their aliens um, emphasis on the word democratic in relation to freedom seems to me to be particularly useful. So I, it feels to me like this book is really helpful in thinking about how the battle for more emancipatory definitions of freedom continues and, and for more just and democratic ones. So I'm really very grateful to you, Annalene, for this long labor that you've produced and for the scope of history that you've encompassed. And also for um, to Mark and to Manjeet for helping to open it up so well. So thanks everybody for coming. Thanks you all for participating. And on behalf of the ISRF, I'd like, I'd like to say I'm looking forward to volume two. <laughs> See you all soon. <laughs>